This is Beyond the Physics. All right. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Beyond the Physics podcast. This is your host, Joseph Guzman, and I'm joined, as always, with my co-host, Irene Roman. It's a pleasure talking to you guys today. Um, so this is going to be our first update since September 2019. It's been quite a while since our last recording, but um, this was a uh, and is a project I'm passionate about. I want to continue producing content for this podcast. I think it's important. And right, so we're just here to basically give you an update on what's been going on in our lives the past year, um, our take on the current events in the world um, since September 2019. A lot has happened, um, both personally and at the world abroad. Um, so basically how we've been doing since COVID and with now the George Floyd protests. Um, we're at the beginning of June. So um, basically the world is just constantly updating day by day. So who knows what's going to happen by the time this comes out. But regardless there's still a lot to catch you guys up on and um hopefully we could start talking about the future of the podcast and get some more content out to you guys so um anyway so i guess i'll just start with myself um and recollecting what happened since september of 2019 so that was um our fall semester and for the fall semester, so the the main reason why I felt I couldn't create content for the podcast was because I was taking uh, two classes at the time. One was hydrodynamics, and then the other was electric electricity and magnetism part A. So in my program, you know, you have six core classes, right? Like kind of like the foundations of physics that are important for you to do well in, and electricity and magnetism is one of those. Um, and so uh, I'm gonna try to do this as tactfully as I can, talking about my experience with this class, but that might be difficult. So, um, so electricity and magnetism, right? The professor is kind of uh, notorious, right? For being, a, well, here goes the tact already, uh, for being a hard ass, right? He's kind of, um, in my opinion, a little bit of an extremist in terms of his philosophy of how you grade and perform in a class. And I've had experience with this man before, right? So when I first came to the program, I took this class and I ended up dropping it, um, more or less. And so I knew what I was getting myself into. Um, I was prepared for a very difficult journey, and that and that it was. It was it was very difficult. So, um, because of that, uh, I really struggled during the fall to just keep my head above water. Um, I can't remember if that was also when I was teaching a uh, hybrid. Was that at the same time? Yeah, you were teaching hybrid. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah. I mean, that explains why I couldn't do anything. Right. So at the time, I was also teaching intro physics class. And um, for some reason, the structure was just totally crazy. Uh, me and another uh, graduate student taught 120 students. Right. So um, we had on average 60 students, whereas, you know, um, most TAs have up to 40 generally. So I had a lot more work um, than usual. Um, so it was very difficult for me to make any type of content and to just basically do anything other than try to get a PhD, right? <laughs> Which I'm sure is understandable. But um, I guess there's still a lot more to talk about in terms of that E&M class. I don't know um, how to unpack it, right? Um, <clears throat> But basically, I'll just summarize that the experience was kind of traumatic, honestly. 
Um, so, <laughs> like, uh, not only was it hard work, right, but I didn't do well in the class either. And I already struggle with feelings of imposter syndrome, right, of feeling like I'm not good enough and I don't belong in physics in general, I guess. Um, this is where conversations about being a minority is also important. I mean, like not all <laughs> what feeds into this also is that like, I feel like I don't look like the rest of the people that are around me. Um, which I think does play some, at least some small role into those feelings of imposter syndrome. But, um, yeah, so it was just really tough, right? The fall semester was tough. Um, basically is just how I would summarize it. And that's why I didn't record anything. Um, I did end up doing well in hydro. Um, and I ended up getting a C in electricity and magnetism, uh, part A. And that caused some drama down the line. Because um, for the core classes, you need to get like a B average, right? And so it's difficult to do that because I need there's a part B to the E and M class, which I took just last semester. Um, and so that put pressure on me to do better than I did previously, right? And so we can unpack that later. But um, yeah, so <laughs> I don't know if... You were there to experience the whole thing, so I don't know if you have any questions for me, but... Oh, in terms of how the experience for you during that class? Just f the whole fall. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it was, I mean, that coupled with the hybrid class that took up, I don't know how many hours a week do you think you were dedicating to that class that you were teaching, and then on top of it, um, your E and M class and then your other class. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Um, I did the calculation once <laughs> because I tried reaching out to the, um, supervisors of our program as well as my supervisor for teaching. Um, I did calculate the number of hours I did and I plotted it, <laughs> um, to present to them to say, look, I'm doing this much work. This is how much you're asking me. Um, you're being unfair, right? Uh, didn't do, <laughs> didn't do anything. Uh, but yeah, I don't, I don't remember the exact numbers, but in my head, I think I plotted like conservatively. I was spending like, I don't know, about 20 hours a week. For what? For teaching. Oh, for teaching. And then all the others. And then probably <laughs> probably 20 hours a week just on the E&M homework alone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then uh, I don't remember how much for hydro homework. Hydro was like once every other week, I think. But that did take a lot of time. I mean, you would help. <laughs> we would work together on that sometimes. Yeah. So you know how long that took. Yeah. Roughly. And then to try to get any research done on top of that. You know, so I'm probably looking... Probably getting close to like 80 hour work weeks, I guess. What's a normal work week supposed to be again? 40. Oh, okay. So double that. <laughs> I mean, I know that, you know, when you get really barely busy, you don't have weekends. I mean, you don't have nights. You don't have weekends. It's the reality I feel of being a graduate student. Um, and now with this online courses that we have to teach and the course I'm teaching now, it's just like uh, we haven't come up with a good mechanism yet and I'm not really good at kind of ta time management and separating myself from work. So students will email me in the middle of the night, 10 p.m. and I'm responding. So, yeah, I mean, that's something that we definitely have to figure out as the society, I guess, if we're going to try to keep online yeah. functioning going is because then work and home blend. Right. And yeah. Where exactly do you draw the line? You have to be um, strict with yourself in terms of how you manage that. Yeah. 
But I mean, I kind of like it too at the same time. I mean, I like the flexibility in terms of sometimes, you know, I don't have to answer right away and maybe it's 11 p.m. And then I give them a good response because that's the time that I feel like I am able to do that. Then it's okay. It's not looked neg- looked at negatively. <laughs> and a lot of jobs, if I don't know where I've heard this, but maybe this is old school now and it's no longer pertainable to so the way things are now, but they used to say, oh, if you email late at night, then it looks bad on you as a, an employee or something. Mm. But I don't know why that is. I mean, if you stay up till 2 or 3 a.m., I mean, what's the problem? Yeah. To email at that time. I mean, I know a lot of the physicists in our department email at like 3 in the morning and professors yeah. email like early in the morning. And yeah, exactly. Kind of like, I feel like... That- maybe it's a physics culture. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I feel like maybe in the, it's a different world, perhaps like different circles than I've been in that care about that kind of stuff. Yeah, but but um, I mean back to the to the subject at hand after that little tangent. Um, I mean I just remember you being really stressed out that semester, in terms of how much work you had to do, and it's been hard. I think for me too, the first semester um 20 fall 2019 because I wasn't taking any classes the first semester I didn't have to take any classes because there weren't any classes offered that I needed there are a few more classes I have to take but they're only offered in spring semester so I didn't take anything in the fall but I didn't really have a solidified research group and I um, had previously been working with an with an advisor but he he said he wasn't really getting funding and it seems like he was um he's been more dedicated to his teaching than research so he kind of did in um he kind of encouraged me to find another group so I was looking for another group in the summer and I started working with a high um high energy theorist a newer professor here um and into the fall but I wasn't being productive at all and I think it really had to do with how I didn't really feel comfortable with this advisor and this person. And I didn't feel safe, honestly, not because he's a bad person or not because he can't be a kind person, but he just seemed like the kind of his personality, maybe wasn't as sociable as other people. Um, It's just, he was seen kind of rigid and his expectations and how he thought that a researcher in that field should be. Um, And it really did not work with my personality or my work method um, and I guess, you know, my needs. And I have imposter syndrome issues and I have, I shouldn't say, one of our professors said I shouldn't say I have low confidence, which to tell the truth, I think that, um, I think I can be confident, but uh, I guess I still have some I guess I have reservations in speaking up for myself and my ideas in general because um, I either feel like they're going to be dismissed and then it kind of hurts when people dismiss your ideas completely um, or that they'll tell me that, you know, I'm not maybe worthy of of studying this subject because I'm not intelligent enough or there's something about me that's not good enough to do this thing. Um And there's not that many women role models in terms of the field that I'm interested in and in physics in general. So uh, I don't know. I just feel like I need to find an advisor that matches, matches that and matches my needs, which would be kind of a collaborative environment, someone who understands that I might do things differently, who might understand that sometimes it takes me a little bit longer to do some tasks that for someone else they could do more quickly um someone who's going to be understanding kind and actually show that they're listening to me and and not make me feel like uh stupid for not knowing something you know like someone who's willing to teach me um so I think with that advisor I wasn't really getting that vibe and I wasn't feeling safe because of that and so I kind of had a little bit of an existential problem issue I guess um that semester I mean, I debated whether I wanted to be be there still and whether 
this was what I should be pursuing. Um, I really want to do this. Is there something else that my skill set is is more tailored towards? Um, I didn't. I I guess I genuinely was questioning whether I had the strength to really like push through this culture that I think can be pretty toxic sometimes. But within that culture, there are really great people who um, really you may not notice them or notice that they're there, but there's a lot of them that actually care about people. Um, And they interact and they have empathy and um, they, I guess it seems like it's genuine for them. I mean, they really look at you as a person and who you are as a whole. And I guess that semester, that's what I was struggling through figuring out do I have the strength to keep going in this field am I ever going to find someone like that and because of professors I have met in the past um one of the professor that taught quantum field theory for the two semesters that I took it um she's a woman and she's she's amazing I think personally she's um she's established in her field and she's really knowledgeable she respects everyone she's very kind understanding um and she was, she's been a great mentor and support to kind of remind me that I should keep pushing for what I'm interested in. So after that semester, I kind of left, I kind of ghosted this professor and I felt really bad and I still have never really even gotten back to him to tell him, sorry, it's not working out, but I think he got the message, right? So I still feel a little bit guilty for the ghosting. I hate doing that, but I feel like it's been kind of one a coping mechanism I've had in my whole life is just run away, disappear whenever something feels unsafe. I just run, right? Um, and that's tied to probably experiences. Well, yeah, experiences I've had, you know, as a woman um, growing up and stuff. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I've come a long way, I think, since that semester. I mean, I kept, I pushed through. I was thinking of taking a semester off because I kind of really wasn't in a good space or mindset. Um, but I talked to one of them, another advisor and my old advisor, and he's and he suggested that you know I talked to this other new professor in in the high energy department who does a uh, more he does high precision calculation as where the other one was a model builder, and so I talked to him and the work seemed interesting, and really I just wanted to see if I would match we would match in terms of personality what I needed. And yeah, he's, he's, it's been great so far now that I'm actually working with him. Um, he gave me a chance to start in the spring and, uh, every meeting I've had, he's listened. He's never made me feel like bad for not understanding something. He'll show me whatever he needs to show me. He never assumes that I have any prior knowledge, which is nice even if I do or may already know what he's talking about. I mean, it's nice that he reviews it and gives me his own take on the material. So, yeah, I mean, for anyone out there who is in physics and, you know, is feeling like how I felt, like unsafe, like this culture is really toxic to me, um, and it may even be triggering because of past experiences you've had, um, I would say that for me, um, I'm glad that I kept searching for an ally, for allies, for mentors, people who could help me. And I thankfully I found them. But if it's so toxic and you, there's nowhere that you can go, you can't find any allies there, then, you know, if you have to leave, that's also completely fine. I mean, you have to do what's best for you in the end. Um, But I know that I want to do this because I want to be a mentor one day to people like me who feel like, they can't find a place in physics. And I want all women and all minorities um, to know that you can and you should find a place. And it's not, it's on the scientific community. It's the physicists right now. They're the ones that created, that have allowed this problem to continue in the culture. And I think that I want to be one of the people on the forefront, if possible, to keep pushing and helping the culture evolve into something much better you know, more inclusive. And I think that goes also into how we see the state of our country right now. Um, We need, we need people to start at all levels and just try to keep push this kind of mentality at whatever level, even if it's just with your family and just conversation, 
or if in some way you interact with a bunch of people, just try to listen to their viewpoints and show them that they could be be inclusive to them so that you can show them that um, hopefully they'll learn that they can be inclusive to you and your viewpoints as well. But um, yeah, I don't know. So I guess you can go tell me more <laughs> about your story than that I've well, kind of... <laughs> No, I mean, I, there's a, a lot of points I wanted to jump in, uh, but it's... You should, yeah, you should jump on some points. Right. So I'll I'll just double back to a, a couple things I wanted to say, right? I mean, um, yeah, I think it's good that um, you didn't stick with, uh, I guess, didn't stick with the first professor that um, you were talking with for a potential advisor. Yeah, so I mean, I think a lot of students probably fall into the trap of just um, maybe just I don't know what the word I'm looking for is just just coping, right? Like uh, if they were presented with that professor and they didn't feel safe or comfortable or whatever, they would probably just stick with that professor because really you're kind of limited in terms of the amount of options you have in any given department, right? Yeah, um, it's difficult to find. Um, someone who can mesh smoothly with your personality and is in the field of interest that you want to be in. Um, so I guess I think one, I think that's one problem that I guess probably a lot of students feel trapped. Yeah, I guess. Um, but for me personally, I knew it would be super important to have like, um, a really copacetic relationship with your advisor Right. Like that's probably um, maybe it's confirmation bias, but I mean, I would think for me, I think it's the most important thing about graduate school. Setting you up for success probably is having a good relationship with your advisor um, because it's just going to be you and this man or woman and you're going to be stuck with them for years and years. And basically they're your boss and they tell you what to do and um you're going to be ha have to hang out with each other for a while, right? So yeah. if, say, you tried to tough it out with this other advisor, you would be stuck in a really miserable situation, right, for a while and might end up in the same place anyways. Yeah. So it's good to be sensitive to those feelings, I think. Um, yeah, and so that would just be my recommendation to other people as well is to um, really uh, pull yourself and, and try to understand... Um, your interactions with uh, your advisor or potential advisor and see how you guys mesh before you, um, I guess, commit for too long, right? Um, the other thing I wanted to say was about um, trying to bring up ideas and perhaps getting dismissed, right? Because that's something that's really difficult to do in science, right? Is It's a real tight wire act, right? Because scientists are trained to be uh, so skeptical right we're trained to be able to pick apart arguments and and things like that right so a lot of times i think if you come up with something novel it's going to get dismissed outright by a large proportion of the scientific community right they're not going to take it seriously and i think that's a problem i mean i think we should um be more encouraging and um be more receptive to new ideas even if at first you know there might be some problems with it i mean i think we should be willing to hear them out yeah i mean i don't understand why you know you see it all the time i mean so any social media site i mean i like to record there's a bunch of other places you you see people who write about, you know, their ideas and maybe an idea they have that's obviously not fleshed out. Maybe they don't even have that strong mathematical background or physics background, but they have an idea, right? And then you have people, you see the comment section and they're attacking them. They're so angry saying, that's not true. This, 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 this paper says this, this research says this. And it's like, okay, I'm glad that you're informed. You should be, I think it's good that you're informing people. But why do you have to inform in such like an aggressive manner as if like you're completely trying to shut them down instead of saying, oh, well, I, I know of this work because I've studied this, right? And I know these specifics and I know these, 
these results from this experiment, which doesn't really fit in w- with what you're saying, but maybe can you expand a little more on your points? So instead of creating like a conversation where maybe there is something there um, conceptually that might actually be helpful in some way, because um, we don't, obviously we're far from knowing even a small percentage of what we need, what we want to know of theory of everything or anything. So, I mean, why, I don't understand why we're so quick to be, to aggressively shut any new ideas down. Um, I think it's important to listen to people, even if they're not even trained in physics or mathematics or whatever. Um, I think they are entitled to have those ideas and I don't think it's helpful for us to be so aggressive in shutting them down because A, it just emotionally shuts those people off and then you have the situation that we have now where all these people are angry, afraid of science and scientists and no one wants to listen to scientists and a lot of them probably think we're just elitist, right? We think we know everything and we treat everyone else like they're lower or worse or not as good as us because of that. Um, and I'm like... W- w- if we have a specific knowledge that we've gained, like why would you want to, why would you want to create a perception for people who don't have that knowledge that like, we feel like we are above them because we are the holders of knowledge. Like if you have a knowledge, no one, someone doesn't have personally, I would want to disseminate that knowledge in a way that those people can understand so that we can all now collectively under have that knowledge. And then maybe they have, other ways of synthesizing that with something else and coming up with a novel idea that I couldn't think of, right? Because everyone's minds work differently. Why wouldn't you want to expose the largest amount of people to the largest amount of information instead of shutting them down? Um, And yeah, I mean, I don't know how, I don't know what else to say about that, but maybe you can continue. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, so... um... Right. So, I mean, my first instinct about that is probably, well, one thing is that scientists have to be prepared to shut down charlatans. Right? I mean, um, yeah. unfortunately, that that's kind of like our duty as stewards of knowledge, right? It's like having to deal with situations like of maybe this is <laughs> like Deepak Chopra and Gwyneth Paltrow who exploit science-y woo-hoo, right? Yeah. And take advantage of people, right? Like um, with things like quantum healing and stuff like that. I mean, maybe I will remain open-minded given the context of our conversation, right? I'll, I'll remain open-minded about the possibility of stuff like that, but the way it's presented is clearly not at the level that should be selling people on, yeah, of course. on products or whatever right and they're clearly taking advantage of people who are unaware of the science right um by just appearing like intellectual or something like that so that's where a real professional needs to come up and kind of i think it's almost necessary to be a little forceful in terms of how you correct um the information provided but um to the like the case that you we're bringing up of like just online forms or whatever, just talking to people who may be genuinely curious or something like that. Why would you shut that down? I agree. I think it's a problem. I mean, I, I would think that it's probably just how people are raised, right? Like, um, it's probably how you're taught in, um, like, like taught as a child, either through the church or your parents or whatever you get, um, certain ideas kind of beat into you more or less like you kind of get intellectually or morally kind of dominated as a child without like um having a real like debate or discussion as to the ideas behind it right that you might just be taught no that's wrong don't do that right like because you know as a parent it's kind of difficult to avoid situations like that you know like don't touch the don't touch the stove right it's hot it'll burn you whatever right like no like as a child you might not understand you know um why that's bad without having to have maimed yourself or whatever you know um so anyways i mean we could i'm sure we could go down a long tangent with that but um uh that's just my first instinct right it's probably just 
it's how people were taught to disseminate information is to just dominate people and um right and so if we want to actually if what we care about is having the world progress scientifically then i think that needs to change right yeah i mean and just in general we shouldn't be alienating people i yeah. mean i understand s- there's definitely things that people believe that um really the science completely refutes hmm. like flat flat earth Sure. Right, mm-hmm. lizard people, any of those crazy conspiracy theories, right? <laughs> um, and there's no evidence for any of that whatsoever, right? And there's evidence to the opposing side, so, um, so I mean, with all of that, uh, I guess physical evidence, yeah, I mean, definitely you have to present, um, those facts. Right. But also, I think that as a scientific community, we have to figure out. And maybe, you know, I wish it didn't have to be this way, but people, a lot of people are, like you said, like they grew up and got these ideas instilled in them to a point where I think we've talked about it before. It's part of their identity. There's like an extremely emotional attachment to this, to these ideas. Um, And as scientists, if we, I feel like we're in a position where maybe we can recognize that. Um, And then, so I feel like we should be a little bit more tactful in the way that we present these facts to people because we know, and it shouldn't be like this. You should be able to present facts and people should be able to absorb that and think about how that fits into their ideas um, and their realities and their values. But because that's not always the case and people have these emotional identity attachments, then you have to be careful as to how you present the facts and kind of how you're going to speak with people and so you don't alienate them so they don't get even more pushed off from science and then you have great divides like we have right now and people not listening to people who could really advise you in how you can benefit, find the most beneficial solution for all, you know, because if you do the correct minimization problem, which scientists can think about multiple factors going on with um, a problem, then I feel like we could figure out a solution that minimizes harm or maximizes, you know, well-being for this small time period and maybe the future as well. So I know I'm talking about so abstractly and vaguely because I don't have a specific... There's a lot of things that we could talk about in terms of a certain problem and then what are the factors that go into solving this problem and what affects it, the variables. Mm -hmm. Um, And as scientists, I think that right now in this time period, I think that scientists are really needed. Um, And I think that we need to start making a connection with people who haven't studied science, who are afraid of scientists, who think we're elitist. We have to bring ourselves down a few levels and interact with them just as human beings and show them, no, we're human beings here and we actually want to help everyone. We want the, a world better for you and we want a world better for me. And like, uh, I feel like w- I personally want to listen to everyone, even the people who don't have the same viewpoints as me. I want to listen to them. Like I'm, I don't want this, poli- this, I don't have to, this podcast to get super political, but I mean, I'm not a Trumpster. Right. Um, and, but I want to understand what led people to follow Trump. You know, I really want to understand that. I want to know what are the needs that they're not getting met, that they're fo- deciding to follow this man that I personally think is really toxic, right? So what is he providing for them or what is he seeming to provide them um, that they want to follow him and they think that he's going to be the ones that actually help make their lives better. Um, I want to know that. I want to know their needs. And I want to transparently tell them, think of solutions, help think of solutions and transparently tell them, okay, I, this problem could be fixed by doing this. I can do this X, Y, and Z. And give them a timeline step by step. Like what would be the possible outcomes of this decision that would be made or this policy being implemented? What would be the outcomes step by step? So they know so they have like a complete, uh, I guess, guide of what they expect to see in the future for themselves. You know what I mean? Instead of just saying, oh, I'm going to do this for you, but not giving you any details, you know, it's like, 
it's like, I don't know. I mean, I'm not that, I've never really been so into politics, but now that all of this is going on, like I'm more interested in seeing how things work. And, um, but just from watching the news, I don't really get an idea of what the true plans are of the people in power. Like, what are they trying to do? A, what are their values? What are the ideals? What is their plot? Like, what are the, um, what policies have they implemented? And step by step, like, what the, all the outcomes are going to be of that policy for the next five years, for the next 10 years, for the next 30 years. Like, I wish, and I feel like that's something that a scientist thinks about, right? Um, we want to be as precise as possible. We want to be as detailed as possible. Um, we want to get, we do like the first order calculation, the second order, third order. Like I want to see all of that. Like what are the outcome and then the outcomes on the outcomes, you know, what are all the uncertainties? Um, and I don't see that ever discussed. I know most people maybe won't, can't follow to that detail, but there's not even enough detail to know in general what the expected outcome would be for society and for, for these people. So, I mean, I know I feel like I'm going on a lot of tangents and just talk, kind of blabbing on mm -hmm. today, mm -hmm. but, um, but I guess that's one thing that I would want to see changed is transparency. Like I was thinking that why, you know, late recently we got the census mm -hmm. sent to us. Right. And we had to fill out the information that we live in this house and, um, who our email or at least my email address. So they have my information. If you fill out the census, which I think that anyone that gets a census should fill it out. So they know who you are and they have your information. Um, and through that you could send information, right? So I don't know why our government, even at the local level, well, I don't know why they don't create a, a nice pamphlet. Not, it'll probably be a booklet, let's say. So I don't know why we don't have like a booklet that has all the politicians, everyone working in our government, um, and outlines their major ideals and outlines accomplishments their you know policies they've they've created like just general you know a little bit of background on them. So we have information about them like their backgrounds or their histories like what have they done, um, and then their ideals and their values like what's their platform, um, and puts all that information together in like a, a nice booklet. Maybe it'll be a 30 page booklet. It's probably going to be a long booklet, but it's not going to be super detailed. And then there's like a website or something where you can click if you want more details on a specific candidate. And they have this information about, I know there's a problem not everyone is registered. Not everyone is known like where they live and doesn't have access to that. But at least if you had something like this and on the government website, you could click on it and see this booklet. And then you could get emailed you to, to yourself too, if you're if you're registered with the census or whatever, they have information. Um, and this way, it's transparent. Like, who are the people that are running the show here? Like, what are what are their values? And then the candidates for future. Um, I think it's hard to get this information. And this is one of the problems. People need to be informed. It needs to be transparent. They have to be informed so that they have the ability to... Um, to choose for themselves, like people who they really believe represents them. And people need to be active, right, in the community in that way, I think, in voting and stuff. But um, mm. I think that I went off on a tangent. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of stuff to address there. But um, to your most recent point, I think there are websites that exist already um, to the ends that you're talking about. Uh, I don't remember the specifics, uh, what it was called, uh, but I did take a government class in college and they required we go to this website read up on all the politicians in the local elections they do give like brief synopses of their you know their platform basically of you know what it is they do um yeah so i don't remember the details off the top of my head because it's been years since i've since i did that assignment um but I mean, one thing it doesn't tell you is like, yeah, I mean, so just having the platform often is not enough detail, I think, to make an informed decision. Like a lot of times, 
um, you know, there might be some controversy or something in the person's past that, you know, obviously they're not just going to plaster up on the, on the website. Normally it's well, like, well, they a, should plaster it on the website. Yeah. But normally it's like skeletons in the closet that like you have to really go digging deep. Well, they should put the skeletons. Someone should be in charge of making this, putting the skeletons right there for everyone to see. The implications of that seems pretty difficult to enforce and uh, would be kind of scary to uh, actually do, right? Because then you're basically saying that these people don't have a right to privacy, right? I mean, people shouldn't have skeletons, right? But um, how is it that you get those skeletons out? What do you mean how? Like how you find them or how you... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you might not know what they are. I mean, I don't think that that the skeletons are as, I mean, it would be nice to be able to have that information about someone who, it's like once you're running to, in a way, your representative of this large group of people, I mean, it's a large responsibility. And I myself feel like if I, if I chose to want to represent someone that, um, it would be valid for them to be able to know the skeletons in my closet. That's how I feel. Like, I mean, yeah. yeah. And I guess the other thing is like the sensitivities of the culture around us changes constantly. So what we perceive as a skeleton now might be different in the future. Yeah. Right. Like I'm thinking of Justin Trudeau, the prime minister of Canada, who was caught, uh, you know, he had a picture circulating around Twitter like months ago. Um, because he went blackface to a Halloween party or something. And he apologized for it and stuff like that. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I'm just saying, like, back then, that probably wouldn't be, you know, a skeleton. Now it's just, like, a a taboo, right? It's just, like, why would you do that, right? But um, Well, it's, like, back then, like, marijuana, someone who smoked marijuana could have been a skeleton in the closet. But yeah. now, I mean, now it could still kind of be like that. But now, you know, it's being legalized in so many areas that it's no longer really that much of a skeleton in the closet, right? So, yeah, and yet people are <laughs> <laughs> arrested and still in prison today for yeah, it's marijuana crazy. use. And, you know, it's terrible. That needs to change now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Let's write it on the emerging <laughs> long list of things that need to change. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so, um, right, so I want to get your opinions on that stuff. Um, I'm kind of losing track of all the points that were tossed out there, so maybe we'll just naturally segue back to that. Um, so I guess I'll just hard uh, transition to wrapping up uh, what happened to the other half of the year that was missing. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was our last semester, uh, or most recent semester, uh, spring 2020 right and so that semester i took e and m b and cosmology right we took that together so cosmology was a great class i love that that was with my advisor yeah me too i love that class it was great yeah i learned so much mm-hmm. um it's great like because i always learned about that stuff from like um youtube videos and stuff like that um but it's great to actually see the details in terms of like the mathematics and getting like some real rigor and understanding behind the beginning and end of our universe. Right. That's super cool. Um, yeah, that was the first time that I um, had a back and forth exchange with someone on core about cosmology. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it was good. I learned something. Yeah. I would have never had the confidence to do that before, before yeah. the, before last semester. So that's a plus. That's a win for me. Yeah. That's great. But, um, yeah, so, I mean, that class is juxtaposed with ENMB, right? So I had, uh, and I was teaching astronomy at that time, right? So I had pressure put on me because um, I needed to get a, what was it? I think it would be calculated, a B B minus, right? I needed to get a B minus to maintain certain GPA requirements um, to be in good standing or whatever in the program. Uh, And I found this out after i already bombed the first test I, f- I, f- I forget how bad it was but it was in the single digits i think um which isn't un- that unusual for this class but uh <laughs> <laughs> but yeah so um 
that put a lot of pressure on me in terms of trying of pressure to f- perform and to succeed. Um, and I could tell you that did not happen. I did not get a B minus in the class. I ended up getting a C again. Um, so I'm still in good standing as it turns out. I mean, it just means I have to go and now I have to retake uh, electricity and magnetism, uh, course. Just one some, course. At some point. Yeah. Not both. Yeah, as long as I get a B minus, right? Um, basically, I need to meet a B average GPA. So since I did well in and all the my core courses, since I did well above, you know that for all the other classes, um, it balanced out, right? So I just have to go retake one class. But yeah, so that's really terrible. Um, I hate that, <laughs> but um, could have been worse, right? It could be like you know I'm not just kicked out or anything, but. Um, teaching wasn't as bad. I've taught astronomy before. Um, but yeah, so basically, yeah, in the middle of the semester is when COVID struck, right? And everything changed when COVID attacked. Um, so yeah, in the middle of the semester, COVID happened, uh, basically. Well, it was the beginning of the semester, just. Well, it started we, in February, right? Well, it we, started earlier, but. Yeah, we heard about it, right? Oh, you mean when the school shut down? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes, okay. Yeah, the the school closed after spring break. And we went fully online for the rest of the semester. And um, teaching was difficult because we weren't prepared for that at all. But made it work somehow. Um, but yeah, it was um, really, really difficult for me, I guess. Um, dealing with COVID and my E&M class. Um, basically, like I was already feeling kind of shitty from the semester before, um, but I picked myself up, dusted myself off, and I tried to do better this time. Uh, yeah, so I made some mistakes in terms of choosing my classes, I guess. Um, but yeah, so once COVID hit and I was stuck at home and trying to do well in these classes and it didn't pan out. Um, my motivation tanked, right? I felt, I felt terrible. I felt like the worst I've felt in a while. Um, yeah. And my imposter syndrome was just through the roof, right? It was just like, um, it really felt like the end of my physics career. I mean, it felt like, yeah, clearly I don't deserve to be here. I'm not made out. I'm not, uh, I'm not, you know, what the department or, you know, what physics needs, I guess. I'm not fit to be here. And so I really considered quitting, um, you know, and that's a shame because, you know, we just, we finished most of our classes. I have one, I have one more added onto that list now. Um, I think I have four left now, but, um, yeah, so that was really shitty. It was a really shitty time. I'm still not completely over those feelings. I haven't completely worked them out to be honest. Um, uh, but I'm feeling a little bit better, I guess. Since I started preparing for the quals, the fact that I was able to solve any physics problem whatsoever was comforting. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so I mean, it's been a real roller coaster, right? Because like in terms of my confidence levels, right? Like um, it's been real up and down. It's kind of like the Dunning Kruger effect or whatever that plot is of like your confidence versus your experience, right? Like reaches some high peak and then it plummets <laughs> once you have a certain amount of experience and then it slowly creeps back up. Right. Um, I guess last semester was my plummet. I don't know. Um, I felt like I really didn't know anything. <laughs> so yeah, so it was a dark time for me. I mean, it's still a dark time, it's still a dark time for the country in general. Right. Um, and yeah, on top of that, like, I don't know, like, the fact that I wasn't doing well in physics and the fact that the country was uh, suffering 
and that there was uh, such a bad response from our our government and um, and I felt like with my training and stuff like I could at least make an impact like somewhere anywhere I could do anything else and positively impact people's lives and yet here I am suffering for what right and like you know I worry about you know my dad and um, you know he has to go out and and see people now and you know I feel like he's in that risk community you know has certain comorbidities that that make me worry about him right and like why am I not helping my family or you know stuff like that and so um i guess i felt guilty um for doing a phd felt like a selfish <laughs> feels like a selfish thing um or felt like a selfish thing at the time and so yeah covid um <laughs> did not help my mental state really it only kind of worsened it and so um my advisor bless his heart i mean he said st stuff like he's been more productive than ever because he doesn't have to deal with people or you know all the bureau bureaucracy stuff and you know that's great for him i'm glad he's been productive and stuff um, i don't know if that's still the case but um yeah it wasn't for me so anyways i th <laughs> I don't know if you have anything to chime in there. That's pretty much what I had to say on it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it was hard for me when all of this started happening. when And just seeing how our government just kept fumbling on a solution for us, right? Um, there was no consistency. It was as if he pulled pieces from multiple COVID plans, you know, multiple ways to combat the pandemic. And he just pulled pieces from here, there and everywhere. And collectively together, they didn't, they weren't a very good plan. You know what I mean? Like, and to me, that was frustrating to, to really think there was a much better way. Right. And that, uh, no one was listening to the people who, not that no one was listening because people were listening, right? Um, but not everyone. I mean, there wasn't a collective strategy, right? Because our, the head, our federal government wasn't unified and like helping our country be unified in a solution that made scientific sense. Um, so it was hard to see that and it was hard to concentrate on doing work when you're every day seeing the death toll and, um, not just in the U S but in the whole world and seeing how, how large this is and how, how this pandemic has shaken us on a lot of different levels in our country and in the world. Um, and really seeing how unprepared we are. And, um, that's exactly why I say, I think we need sign more scientists, um, running this country because you'd be able to see, you know, multiple orders, I guess, in the future of the possibility of effects of the thing of the decisions we're making now and care enough to do that assessment and see how, and know how important it is to, um, trust and listen to people who, um, are specialists in things that you are not specialists in, right? Um, but it's frustrating because, for me specifically, because I, like, I felt like, why am I here? Like you said, why am I here doing, trying to get my PhD when there's so much that needs to be done immediately right now to help this country um, so that we don't fall apart? It's, it's, it's like uh, such anxiety. It gives me so much anxiety to see what's happening, and not and feel like I'm helpless because I. It's like I have ideas, and I feel like I have want the best for people in general, um, 
and to see that so many other people who are in power who have the power to do things don't share that same value as me um it's so frustrating and um yeah i mean it's hard to get work done just as hard to get work done and I mean, as the time's going on, going on and yeah, COVID is still a real part of our lives and it's going to be for a while now because of the decisions we've made. Um, we've decided now and basically just have COVID around for an extended period of time, right? We didn't make the necessary and it it's the whole world too wasn't obviously unified and collected in their response either. Um, but we, as a, as a planet are not ready for this, for these things. I mean, we weren't ready for this pandemic. We can't even work together, let alone like have a considered effort to cut this off at the beginning so it can't proliferate anymore, right? Kill it off. That's That would have been the best situation if we could have organized the whole world to just kill it off. But yeah, we can't do that. I mean, obviously, I mean, look at our country. Um, we're so divided. We can't even agree on, we can't agree on anything, right? And make a decision to do anything. So, um, yeah, so it's kind of like these thoughts that kind of overtake me and I'm sure have overtaken you too. It makes it hard to do work. So it's, it's, it's weird to have to go to work. I'm sure go to work or, you know, us go to school, teach, try to learn, try to do a PhD in, you know, some kind of really niche area that doesn't seem to have that much application to the real world right now um, and how we can help it. Yet at the same time, at least for me, like really wanting to do something to just make it go, just stop this, like implement good policies. Um, and I don't have any power to do any of that right now. Um, at least it, it seems like that, but I know there are things that we can do and that I've been thinking about what I can do to help some um, even if it's just, you know, obviously voting and speaking out to our representatives, sending letters about my ideas or possible things that could help. And if they want to listen to it and think about it and talk to other experts, that would that would be fine. Um, so I'm going to continue doing this because I know that eventually having this this accomplishment, um, this the Ph.D., I think it will be helpful in general, my journey. Um and so I want to continue it and I want to finish it. Um, and I'm going to try to, at the same time, make changes and try to help, even if it's just in our university, helping me change there first. Um, and then maybe that can expand, right? Yeah. Keep going outward. Yeah. And I mean, I, I just want to put it out there. You know, it almost doesn't need to be said. And I'm sure I could probably speak for you on this. <laughs> on this point too but i i mean i also recognize i feel very grateful for the position i'm at now you know right like i'm i'm very grateful that you know although i worry about my dad he's not sick yet i'm grateful that no one i know in my family is sick right i'm grateful that i haven't been laid off like the university is still teaching <laughs> i have to work with figuring out everything online but you know that's a minor inconvenience compared to, you know, being laid off or having to deal with unemployment and stuff like that. So I'm very grateful for the position I'm in, but that doesn't, you know, take away the feelings of helplessness and, you know, wanting to contribute to the, to making, you know, to easing the suffering of everyone out there. You yeah. Know? Yeah, of course. Definitely. Yeah. So yeah, it's tough times, right? I mean, I've been putting a lot of this energy into the lap, the class that I'm teaching now. I've been teaching with the same professor, a studio style physics course for, um, you know, non-physics majors, which is the, the first course and the second course. The first one's like classical mechanics. And then the second would be electricity and magnetism. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think that we've been doing a really good job in terms of putting this course online and then also really taking the input of the students and saying, okay, how can we make this a better experience for you? And um, I think it's giving me practice in how to write information in a way 
that people can understand. Like when we, when I was telling you, told me there's information online, right, about the mm-hmm. candidates and so mm-hmm. on. But it's hard. I haven't even found this website, right? So mm-hmm. it's like, yeah, maybe I'm not searching hard enough. But I do search, and these this information doesn't seem that readily available. Mm-hmm. And for people who don't even really know how to do these searches or are not at all um, educated, I guess. I feel like this information is not nearly close to being accessible as mm-hmm. the way that it should be for everyone. Um, and in writing and in creating the material for this course, it's made me realize how important it is just the way that you represent the information on the page, the way it reads. Yeah. If you don't represent it in a way that reads logically consistent, then it's harder for people to absorb the information. Um, and I think that's just something I mean is just to rewrite all of this information in a, in a way that is cohesive and it's collected, mm-hmm. right? Um, and maybe it's something that seems like a little detail, but I think it's actually really important to kind of uh, be able to convey information in a way that people can absorb. Um, and people do it all the time on YouTube and, you know, on all the social media people are, I mean, especially YouTube, people do a really good job, I think, of explaining information. And I'd like to see that move towards um, the more conventional er- um, arenas as well, not just the social media. Because um, there are older people who are not as immersed in things like YouTube and uh, Facebook and all that stuff. And those are people who aren't getting information maybe as easily. And now also there's a big issue with the manipulation of information um, on Facebook and all these. Mm. So, and um, and misrepresentation of information, mm. right? And then now you have all the bots faking to be some people and like coming up and trying to manipulate people into believing something. So, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Sometimes... I don't know where I was going with that point. So <laughs> we could, you could go on. <laughs> I'm a little bit awkward now. I haven't really been socializing much since COVID started. So no, that's okay. Um, I guess I'll keep the truck moving and just hard segue again. Um, yeah, just hard it on. <laughs> Erase that. <laughs> okay. Wait, um, pause. No, <laughs> we're keeping it. But we can get rid of it. It's fine. I'm joking. But, um, mm-hmm, like, you're in general one, take yeah. stuff off. Anyways, um, right. What was I going to talk about? Okay, right. So, I mean, I don't, I don't want to make it seem like, um, well, I don't know. Um, I feel like it deserves some words, right? And I want to do it. Uh, do it justice but I don't want to you know give the wrong impression I guess but um, I feel like we should at least say some words about what's going on with the country the past week and a half now with the George Floyd protests right Um, yeah I'm sure I don't think I even need to go into the details of the incident that happened that sparked the protest but um maybe just uh what we feel about the protests um what we hope comes out of it i guess like the most what we think would be productive for the country and stuff like that right so yeah i haven't really clarified my thoughts on this too much so um bear with me i guess but i guess i am really proud i guess that um the American people, you know, my generation and the generation after us have chosen to stand up and take a stand for what's right. You know, um, I think it's, you know, it's long overdue, right? Like, um, I've been hearing about (laughs) police brutality incidents for years and years. And, um, and I know (laughs) like everything it's a, you know, it's a polarizing issue at this point, but, I think um, most people agree what happened to George Floyd was terrible. And um, 
that it's good that those police officers are being prosecuted. And I think it's important that we, as a country, stand up and try to exercise our First Amendment right to try to make some change so that, you know, um, police brutality isn't something that's just institutionalized and accepted, right? Um, I don't think it's... I don't think it should be controversial to say that <laughs> that is bad, right? That um, that this needs to change. So I don't know if you want to jump in, if there's anything you want to say. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things that <laughs> I could say, I guess. Um, yeah, I mean... <laughs> well, oh, boss. <laughs> well, well, here I'll just t- toss in a random thought I had today. Um, you know, hearing conversations on the topic and stuff like that, people have been saying that because of COVID, you know, it creates the perfect storm, right? The perfect, and um, I agree with that. You know, to some respect, uh, it reminds me of um, Childish Gambino's "This Is America," right? I showed you that recently. Um, one of the messages I took away from it is that, you know, when some type of atrocity occurs and people become outraged at, you know, um, like gun violence or police brutality, et cetera, right? Um, and there is some national outrage about it, people get distracted, right? People get, uh, you know, some new media craze comes out and uh, people forget all about it, right? And we happen to be in the position when everyone is forced to be at home watching this happen, right? They can't watch their sports, right? There's no NBA, there's no, there's no hockey, there's no whatever, right? And so now people can't be distracted from the ugliness that is in our country, right? And finally, it gives them perhaps the, you know, the focus to um, address an issue that's been plaguing our country for decades. Yeah. I mean, and also the fact that a lot of people don't even have employment yeah. right now too. They don't have to worry about getting whatever job they have to get done. So yeah, I mean, all of those things, like you said, be the opportunity to really be focusing on this issue. And thankfully they're, we're speaking out, mm-hmm. right? Um, it's just sad that it seems like, I mean, our government at large right now isn't listening. Um, I think that, I don't know why they, I mean, the tactic that they've you they've chosen to use which is basically more aggression and more violence towards the protesters um is only going to make the situation worse because we're asking for a change in the policies right um and there's no talk really of what those changes will be however yeah i think in more local and more state level I think some, I don't know if you can give me a little more detail on that, if you've read about this or not, but that there are some proposed changes um, to like the police force, maybe in Minneapolis. Um, But I think that I'm just, I just, I just don't know why, why it's taking so long, right? It's so long to kind of empathize and, with this really justified anger Mm -hmm. um, and say, yeah, I mean, you're right. Like, this isn't okay. And we need to do better. And let's come up with a solution together. Like, where you see the police kneeling down with the protesters and walking with the protesters, I'm happy to see that. I think that's a good, like... I think that 
There should be more protests around the country like that instead of the, the police, you know, literally injuring peaceful protesters. Like, I, there's so many videos online now. It's crazy, right? Um, and I don't even know if they're being prosecuted for what they've done. I mean, it's really disgusting to see some of those videos where, you know, this older man recently is in critical condition now, but stable, thankfully, from New York, mm -hmm. right? And how can someone who's supposed to be protecting the people, um, he, peacefully protesting, I think, going up and trying to have a conversation with mm -hmm. this police officer, he's yelling aggressively, pushes him, and then... He hits some, maybe some statue or all, or the cement. So it's the ground, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And then he's just bleeding, bleeding out. Like, what was it? He injured his ear? He's bleeding out of his ear, yeah. And um, just police officers just walking around him like no big deal yeah. while he's on the ground, right? And that's just atrocious. Mm -hmm. How can another human being see that happen and just let it continue and you keep on your way marching and and trying to push off more protesters, peaceful protesters, so. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and there's case after case after case of this, right? And it's really, um, yeah, it's disgusting. I mean, yeah, the, 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 yeah, the ironic thing about it is, right, this whole, the whole reason these protests began, right, is because of police brutality, right? And then the way they respond is with, more police brutality. Yeah, exactly. Like, as if that's supposed to contain the situation at all, right? Like, if people <laughs> are paying attention, you know, in the slightest, they will not... <laughs> you've just given them so much gas to the bonfire that who knows when or if it's ever going to stop, right? Like, it's... Um, yeah, the response is mind-boggling, right, from state local and federal officials right it just really makes no sense whatsoever um yeah and so i guess to tie it to like the goals to the podcast right i'm seeing like a just an overall trend of like what i want to see for the world is just like in physics i want scientists that are also empathetic right it's not i want a welcoming community that's all i really that's that's my vision for the future right and you know i don't think i think that should be true of the government as well and the and police and state and local officials right i think um it's their duty to empathize with their people right they should be able to they should be able to understand and empathize with what everyone is feeling and clearly the president is not up to the task on that um he's too busy protecting his own ego right so yeah yeah anyways i mean i know you said he didn't want this to become a political podcast uh, <laughs> i mean it's fine to trickle in a little bit if, if it's, it's irrelevant right yeah, no, I like I said, I think it's important to at least say a few words. Yeah, this. of course. Um, I mean, but like we were watching um, Eigenbrose today, mm -hmm. and you mentioned that it's not real; it's no longer really a political issue, right? Mm -hmm. It's a social justice issue, or like I don't know, social issue. Mm -hmm. What well, I don't know what the word, what exact words did he use? Do you remember? I don't know. Social justice warrior. I don't know. Yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, at this point, it's it's I've never like I said, I've never been like super involved in politics, which I think is is kind of a mistake. I feel like I should be. I think it's important. Um, and but this incident, because I think it's such a violation of just rights. Yeah. Um, that I. I guess it's kind of sparked the fire in me in in being interested and in doing a little bit more learning about uh, what's going on and finding ways in which I can try to make a change for the community at large, right? Yeah. Um, 
I've always wanted to do that in education and that's still going to be a goal of mine because I think that education is one of those fundamental pillars mm -hmm. for uh, finding equality. And I think it's something that I have had experience in enough that, um, and I think that it's something that I really am passionate about and enjoy and I could be talented in it, that I feel like it's something that I should, um, I should pursue change in that arena but i want to find other ways as well other avenues that i can also assist right being a scientist and i'm gonna like i've said like three times already i think that yeah we need more scientists in politics we need more scientists like running the show here because uh we're literally destroying our planet and this isn't a joke anymore this is serious um we're we're just des we're destroying ourselves like yep. um and there's no need for the kind of division that we have, right? We can all get our needs met. We will have to compromise things, but it's not going to be to the point where you're going to live a terrible life, you know? I mean, I think, I know I'm an idealist, so anyone who reads, they're like, you're an idealist. But I mean, I'm fine with you call anyone calling me that because I know at least if I keep this idealism, I'm going to always want to fight to make the world better for people because I always have, um, being idealist, I always in my heart believe that people can be better. So I'm never going to dismiss anyone saying you're rotten, like you can't get better. Um, there will, there are probably exceptions to that. Um, not full exceptions, but where maybe their track record is so tainted that I can have sympathy for and, empathy for those people but I don't really see that it's viable that they're going to be changing to changing their um personalities or their values if and I'm um, actually caring for individuals and caring for others needs um there are some people that I mean I'm just I guess what I'm trying to say is that um I still try to have empathy for even people who I think are toxic basically I can still have empathy for those people um but I think at large there's at least a much better way to do things where more people can be reached and more people's needs can be met than the way that we're doing them now um and I think that scientists could really help along the way but in the scientific community as far as I know specifically in the physics community, there's still work to be done in that particular culture, as we've talked about a lot. Um, people, in, I think, just bringing more empathy exposed without, within the culture is necessary, right? Even though I said at individual levels, there's a lot of people who are very understanding and kind and empathetic. But at large, in the overall community, that, that emotional side is not really so exposed, and I think that that needs to be opened. Mm -hmm. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, we need empathetic scientists, I guess, who can go with logical plans, uh, do good calculations, I guess, minimization problems, maximization well-being problems, and, and people who can explain this information in a way that all types of people, uneducated or educated, can understand and people who will listen to educated uneducated people and not belittle them right mm -hmm. that's their experience why are you belittling it belittling it um we should try to understand it mm -hmm. so we can meet their needs um and we're not seeing any of that yeah so i mean right okay so um, <laughs> this is I feel like I go, I just keep like word vomit sometimes right now. I, I know it's been a while since I've talked on, ca on it's not on camera, on recording. So <laughs> I'm a little nervous. <laughs> okay, That's we'll okay. keep going. <laughs> no, it's well spoken. Right. So, um, um, right. So I was just, I think, um, thinking about like concluding remarks. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah. so, uh, just our plans for the podcast in the future right now that we've 
got a update in the tank right what is it that we would like to do well what is it that we hope to bring out to the people any ideas me well i think today we've talked about a lot of things and i think i've talked about them really abstract abstractly and um i haven't said any like main points or main solutions or ideas right explicitly i think it would be interesting to tackle a few maybe of these topics that we've discussed today in a little bit maybe more detail and maybe some possible ideas we think and then you guys could maybe give us some feedback on what you think and any ideas on how you would tackle the current issues that we that we have going on in the country right now um because it's important to not just say you know this is bad we need to change it but to come up with solutions i think we need to mobilize i think that we have a lot of good ideas in general this everyone in this movement but i think that what we're really missing is the actions to get this done we need organization and we need leaders um who have connections to kind of push this through so um i think i'd like to talk a little bit on that and i'd like people to contribute if they can and on the side of less on the side of i guess philosophical projects um i'd like to you know include a little bit more debates on topics like consciousness mm -hmm. free will mm -hmm. maybe have a series about that we can invite our good old friends eigen bros it's like to a fight it out dropped, ding right? ding ding we got name dropped twice right so check out eigen bros at youtube mm -hmm. some cool dudes <laughs> Right. And then I don't know if you still have hopes for the imposter syndrome yeah. podcast, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, we've already talked about it um, a little bit, our experiences with imposter syndrome. Uh, we were hoping to do some more creative aspects with that, like have some maybe poetry or just like written word, you know, prose, whatever, um, like live readings of it. Um now might not be the time, but just something to put on your radar is, I guess I'll put out one call to action is like, if you could send us um, any writings you'd like us to read on the air about your experience with imposter syndrome, um, we'd be happy to check it out and you might get featured on the podcast. Um, and if you're interested in jumping on and giving us the live performance, I guess you'll have to reach out, <laughs> contact us, contact us at our uh, email provided. Um, or you can send us a recording and we'll record and we'll play it yeah. in the next podcast. Yeah, that as well. But I mean, so I don't know when that will happen. Um, I have to work on writing my details out uh, and stuff like that. I have that. a little thing I wrote, so. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, but we'd love to hear from you guys. I think that would be a great collaborative project to, to have. Um, and depending on how that goes, I mean, I think it would be nice to just get people to write about anything that you know really causes you to f really feel emotional you know whatever it is whatever that emotion is it can be therapeutic to write it out and um we would invite any anything that you guys would like to say about anything basically why not <laughs> <laughs> well yeah so of course uh we we would like to have more um interviews with um other scientists and other people um to hash out um problems with the culture what to do uh after physics should you get into physics uh you know and then as well as perhaps delving deeper into these current event issues and politics and things like that right is there is there anything else i missed uh no that's good i think that's what we covered um yeah oh and shout out to our new physics mascot beyond the physics mascot 
um, Sage. She's our new puppy girl. And she's, how old is she now? 14 months old. Yeah, yeah. So since we last had our podcast, we uh, rescued a, a sweet little Labra healer. Right? And uh, she's currently sleeping in the background here. It's about time for her dinner. She looks up at me when she hears dinner. But, um, yeah, it's a little, yeah, it's about her dinner time. But um, she's, she's a great addition to the Beyond the Physics family. And she's definitely helped me and I'm sure you as well through the hard times lately. So, yeah, I mean, this might be old news with COVID and the country opening up and stuff, but you know, um, rescuing a dog has been a great decision, especially before the pandemic. Uh, you know, if we're trapped at home, at least we have some animal companionship here and, um, I'm sure if there's any animals currently in the shelters now, you should consider uh, rescuing and um, giving them a place to stay. Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah. All right. Well, so um, it's been great. I mean, I'm glad that we had this little update, this little chat. Um, and I'm glad if you guys are here uh, with us to the end, uh, we love you. Thank you for uh, sticking around this long you're a real trooper. Uh, I know it's been a while since we've recorded anything. We apologize profusely, please. And um, yeah, uh, go check us out on, you know, whatever your favorite us on your favorite uh, podcast listening platform. Uh, we have a Twitter. I don't use it, <laughs> but feel free to follow us at Beyond the Physics. Um, and yeah, so. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you. Peace out.